libertarian counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, John Cameron, the author of Rekill, Rewire, and Aristocracy, and Philip Lorea, the publisher of Minute Dot and a financial advisor. Is that the correct term? That is correct. Okay, all right, great. Free market firefighters uh, in uh, uh, Chico, or not in Chico, in Paradise, we had, near Chico, we had uh, a great loss of life. Meanwhile, in Southern California, uh, due to the you know, fires, the wildfires, uh, meanwhile, in Southern California, in the, in the Malibu area, we had less. And one of the reasons is because uh, Kim Kardashian and her husband, Kanye West, uh, had the forethought to buy an insurance policy that included uh, private firefighters in addition to the public uh, f firefighters that would be, uh, that would be uh, provided in that, in that town. So they were able to save the West House. In addition, they were able to save the entire neighborhood. Do you think a private firefighting contract in Paradise would have had the similar result? Uh, <clears throat> it would have helped a little bit, but, but Paradise um, had some additional problems. Um, the, how, many of the houses were very old, and um, I'm not saying that you know, government mandated codes or a solution to anything, but um, in Paradise you had um, houses right in woods, you had um, lots of older homes that didn't have fireproof roofs and all the rest of that. But I think anywhere you have privatization, um, you have more effectiveness. And in, in firefighting, you remember the days where you came from a small there, small town. My dad was on the volunteer, volunteer fire department. Volunteer firefighter. Yeah. And that, um, that model actually works better than professional firefighters. It's interesting. Uh, there is a uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, has uh, mm -hmm. a, a rural, a rural, uh, urban, or rural, rural something or another, rural metro mm -hmm. uh, fire department, which is a privately owned company that uh, basically contracts with uh, the city of Scottsdale and several other uh, municipalities in Arizona and elsewhere to provide firefighting uh, services. And they put together a model which uh, eliminates uh, the 99% uh, downtime, 1% actually firefighting uh, mm -hmm. situation that you have with most urban fire departments. Firefighters spend most of their time waiting for a fire to happen and, uh, the, the, you know. Cooking, the, cleaning equipment, yeah, and, uh, the rest calculating the, their retirement. The rest of the time they actually go yeah. out and fight fires. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of downtown or downtime. Uh, but they're still making the same highly unionized pay, uh, union paid uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, recompense. Meanwhile, uh, in, in Scottsdale, what, what Rural Metro did is they said, okay, we'll have a skeleton crew of firefighters that sit in the firehouse waiting for a fire to happen, but we will also have uh, a, a cadre of people who are on call, who can be call, who, who you know agree to be uh, at the scene of a fire within five or ten minutes uh, once they are uh, paged or highly uh, trained, called. highly trained, highly trained, same training, same everything. Uh, they're paid to be on call, but much less than being paid mm -hmm. to be a, a professional full-time firefighter. So these are other quite a, quite a few of them are other city employees or just whatever. They have they have regular day jobs but day jobs where they can leave if they need to to go fight a fire when 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 needed so it's a, it's a much better much more uh, efficient and just as effective model uh, the uh, the uh, you know rate that they put out fires in Scottsdale is better or as good as or better or better than the, the rate at which fires are put out in uh, cities uh, protected by professional uh, urban uh, you know government run fire departments there are some other factors at work in in um now, there's an awful lot of people now living uh, amongst um, the wilderness, as part of the wilderness. And um, in the state of California especially, you see these great conflagrations. And part of the problem is, is, is very, very bad forestry oh, management. Back at the, after the turn of the century, all these national forests and, and many state-owned forests, which means, of course, people have no interest in caring for them because there's somebody else's have uh, somewhere between five and 10 times as many trees per acre, uh, and some even greater. The Southern Sierra is, is an example of that, than the, um, than the area can support. And when they made these forests, they were supposed to be actively managed where you would have you know, cattle grazing on them, people would be able to mine in them, and most importantly, uh, you'd be able to harvest timber. So these, these forests would be uh, uh, freed of timber. And, and even in the areas where, where people can maintain 
uh, and clear the area around their home. If they, are, if they do cut down trees, if they can get a permit to do it, brush they can cut, but if they need to cut trees down, they get a permit, it's illegal for them to sell that timber. Well, they yeah, I mean, we away, have we have a, we sell. have a situation where sixty percent of the forest land in California, uh, fifty nine percent, something like that, is owned uh, essentially by the federal government, either owned or controlled by the federal government, national parks, uh, Forest Service, uh, Bureau Bureau of Reclamation, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, another uh, thirty nine, I think, percent or thirty thirty some percent of of the forest land is owned privately, mm -hmm. and then the rest, the other four percent is is uh, owned by either the state itself or uh, by counties. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a situation where most of the fires, the vast majority of the fires, are on or at least start on Public federally land. controlled yeah. land. Yeah. Yeah. And the federally controlled land is where the tragedy of the commons that you speak of starts because nobody has responsibility, so nobody is really taking care of it. And then, of course, you've got uh, misguided environmentalists lobbying very, very uh, strongly and through the legal process to prevent any harvest of timber whatsoever, which means that the forests are not thinned the way they mm -hmm. should be in order to prevent uh, tinder from building up. And yeah, so that's, that's the reason why we have a lot more uh, forest fires in California than perhaps historically. It has nothing to do with global warming, or very little to do with mm -hmm. global warming, more to do with uh, unsound management practices, which are, I think, correctly laid at the feet of, the correctly laid at the feet of uh, environmental activism. Well, it, it, it's even worse than that. After a fire happens, it takes... Um, Logging companies would love to let's let's forget about the 1.6 billion dollars a year in in um, good jobs and income producing and tax revenue that are lost in Northern California counties because of the lack of the timber industry, but um, when a forest burns, then many trees are are basically um, salvageable, and and they should be removed because once they stop living, they they turn into basically kindling. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at, at quote-unquote natural forest, what happens is branches start at about 20 to 30 feet off the ground because fires go through, burn out all the underbrush, which is fuel, and, and burn the branches up the tree. The tree is living, but the branches start higher up the tree. So after a fire would be a prime time with all the brush cleared out for, for logging companies to have access to go in and, and do... Um, uh, basically, I forget the Selective word. harvesting. Selective harvesting. Yeah. Um, but it takes longer to get the permit approved to do it than the viable life of the tree after the fire. So by the time you, you put the permit in place, you want to go get the logs. Once you get approval, the logs are no longer viable as lumber because they've stood there too long or they're on the ground too long. And again, you talk about regulatory excess. That's another example of it. The problem, of course, is <coughs> solvable by privatizing. But privatize, privatize, <laughs> privatize. We'll Early wait for that. Bed. Privatize and, and also uh, allowing uh, competition in firefighting. And I mm -hmm. think, uh, or competition or cooperation is probably a better word between the private sector and the public sector. You know, keep your public fire departments if you really feel more comfortable with them. But at the same time, bring in private uh, the the ability to uh, for people to through their insurance I mean, companies. I, think I'm a, I live in a condominium association. I'm we're supposedly have a fireproof quote unquote roof, but we live right next to the American River, and uh, on occasion um, it hasn't happened in a long time. The homeless popu population has a tendency to live there, and um, they light the place on fire. And I wonder what a rider. Um, having uh, access to private firefighting would cost the association probably not that much. Uh, I'm not and sure I'd, about the association, yeah. but the uh, policy yeah. that uh, the Cardassian was, had was something so under ten thousand dollars. It's five to eight thousand, and their structure was worth forty million, 50, something like that, 50. fifty million. So that's that's a pittance. I mean, if it was the same thing on my little, I mean, not your mansion, but you know, my little house, um, it would be not not carry the not next to nothing. I'd be willing to pay for that out of my own pocket. Speaking of expensive fire departments. There was an expensive fire department in the town of Calamisa in Riverside County in mm -hmm. Southern California. The uh, fire department was uh, had a had a, a, a pension program, a defined benefit pension program, mm -hmm. that was driving the city, literally driving the city, or on the verge of driving the city into bankruptcy. The fire department was run by 
the county, which in turn was run by Cal Fire. Mm -hmm. So you had two layers of administration. Two layers of bureaucracy. Two layers yes. of bureaucracy on top of the people who were actually sitting in the firehouse waiting for a fire to start. And the mayor of uh, Calamisa, a guy by the name of, a libertarian by the name of Jeff Hewitt, decided- uh, Jeff, our hero. Jeff Hewitt decided this is not a good plan. We need to do two things. We need to get Cal Fire and the county out of the business of providing <coughs> fire protection in Calamisa. We can do it ourselves. We can do it for less money as far as the actual cost of firefighters is concerned. And we can switch from uh, defined benefit pensions to private sector style 401ks or 403bs and save a huge amount of money and get rid of the risk that we run into with defined, pension, uh, defined uh, benefit pensions. He, he did that. He made those reforms successfully. And people recognize that he made those. People in Calamisa and elsewhere in the county recognize that he basically saved the city from bankruptcy. So he decided to run for county supervisor in Riverside, Riverside County. County. Now let me tell you about Riverside County. Riverside County is in the Inland Empire, just outside of LA. It has a population of, of over uh, two, hundred, two and a half million, roughly. It's the 11th largest county in the United States. 11th largest county in the United States. It has a higher population than 25 states. 25 states have a smaller population than, than, than Riverside County does. He won. He won in a district of 438,000, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the election was close. It was, uh, ended up being 51.7 for Jeff and 48.3 uh, for his Republican opponent, uh, who was a former assemblyman and very well known in the district, but obviously not well known particularly fondly. So, you know, we have, uh, uh, I think, probably the best and the most uh, uh, braggable, the, the, you know, the, the most uh, praiseworthy libertarian victory in the history of the Libertarian Party that took place in California uh, this, this, this November. Power to the people. And he did things, remember the, the right before the Trump-Hillary uh, campaigns, right before the election, the, the Democrats made uh, trumpeting noises about their, their ground game. They said that Trump didn't have a ground game, and, and because of that, he was going to lose the election. And, and what Jeff Hewitt did was he, um, he won this basically by having the ground game. The, the other two parties had basically forgotten how, or lost the ability, lost the will to campaign because they thought it was a gimme. And, and he got people on the street, a lot of millennials, a lot of uh, full-time volunteers going door to door, um, talking to people about issues, asking them about, uh, not about their party affiliation, but what they believed in. And they had conversations with people and people thought, oh, you know what, I, I, uh, I might not be a Democrat, I might not be a Republican. Well, in fairness, I it was a nonpartisan election, so yeah, he didn't yeah, have to yeah. wear the... He didn't have to wear a party label. Yeah. Uh, but Boomer Shannon, his uh, campaign manager, and now, Boomer. now his uh, chief of staff, yeah. said the reason we won this election is due to good old, old-timey old politicking. And by that he meant the volunteer efforts going door to door, Knocking asking people doors. if they wanted to have a, a Jeff Hewitt lawn sign. They put up a forest of Jeff Hewitt lawn signs. There were, uh, there were uh, Bo, that was the, uh, the, his opponent, uh, signs at the various intersections. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you get, got into the neighborhoods, it was all, it was all Hewitt. Uh, he, he did the job. Uh, Do you he, know Jeff Hewitt? You know I, I know Jeff Hewitt, yes, absolutely. Oh, cool. He's all on the Libertarian National Committee uh, re representing California You're get him on and the other, show? other Western states. I, he's going to be too busy, I suspect. Mm -hmm. But if he's, he's welcome to come on the show anytime. <laughs> well, it goes to show as well that you know, the path to the higher offices is through these smaller offices with the proven ability to govern. And um, you see that in so many ways uh, where some of these smaller offices, whether it's a board of supervisors or a board of ed somewhere or something to do with the money invariably at county and city levels, demonstrate an ability to govern, uh, you know, have positive results, and, uh, you know, that ultimately over the next 10 or 12 years may very well be sort of the path to say, uh, Jeff Hewitt did this, 
and look at the result, and now he's running for whatever, state senator, you know, California senator. Yeah, and that's kind of the philosophy of the LP going forward, is to run, we ran uh, over 800 uh, candidates nationwide in 2018. And going forward, the idea is to run a whole lot of candidates uh, for probably in the most, obviously for city council <coughs> and, uh, and uh, county supervisor, those kinds of positions, but, but also, can, yeah. But which are which are eminently winnable, but also for state assembly and state senate, because if you run enough candidates in the state for state assembly and state senate, if you run say for all, you know half or all of the uh, seats, you can concentrate on one or two or three, and the Republican or Democratic incumbent probably won't see what's coming if that's the one you know if they feel like they have to defend all of them, you might be able to win one or two of them. How do you think Janice B. Afsky is going to affect that? I think. Uh, Janice, it's gonna, that's it's interesting. It's going to really because, yeah, help yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, independent. Jan, uh, Jan, Janice didn't really take effect before the, uh, Hewitt's election, mm -hmm. but he said there, that uh, there were there was four hundred thousand dollars of union money spent on his Republican mm -hmm. uh, opponent, which is very interesting. Uh, that pr that money will be less readily available going forward. Mm -hmm. It was it didn't affect it for this election cycle, but going forward, that probably will have an effect. Yes. Cool. Um, the uh, speaking of the Libertarian National Committee, uh, it passed a resolution calling for the recognition of Lieberland. Tell us about that, Philip. A uh, little strip of land. Uh, uh, nobody had claimed it, and um, and so they're saying, "Hey, we want to have this little enclave, this little piece of land, and we're going to set up our own uh, government." Uh, and it sounds, you know, it, it, it's whimsical, but the fact is, is there are some huge precedents. One of the ones most recently, one of the most successful uh, early angel investors, a guy named Peter Thiel here in uh, mm -hmm. California, uh, uh, backed Facebook in its early days, backed PayPal in its early days, before they were publicly traded companies. Wealthy, wealthy man, also a libertarian. His idea... Uh, and there was quite a scuffle over it a couple of years ago. His idea was to build essentially a floating city sitting outside San Francisco just in international waters. And with all of the technology and and there was nothing, uh, you know, there was all the speculation because they were building something in the harbors and nobody could figure out exactly what it was. But the idea was to say, hey, look, we're in international waters. Uh, we've built this thing. Uh, it's large enough to be a city. Uh, with a little technology to move it around, we can do this. And you go back to um, uh, Liberia. You know, this was Thomas Jefferson's brainchild, essentially to create a country for um, uh, to deport the slaves. He didn't know what else to do with them. Uh, he, he always felt that if they stayed here, that they would they would kill all the white people because they'd be justified in doing it. Was basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing him. And his solution was to say, let's find a strip of land, let's find land, and let them go. So this idea that there should be a little place that should set up its own government as long as nobody else has claimed it uh, is not as far-fetched as it might sound. Well, yeah, the, the history of, of Lieberland and how that uh, strip of land, that 2.7 acres, came to be unclaimed is kind of interesting. The border it's on between, the Danube. Yeah, the border between be Croatia and uh, uh, Serbia is the Danube River. River. Now, like all rivers, the the course of the river changes over time uh, with geoengineer, you know, dams and engineering, water engineering, as well as just you know the natural change in the course of a river. So Serbia said the border of between our two countries is right down the middle of the Danube River as it stands today. Croatia said, no, 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 wait a minute. No, the border should be where the border, where the river flowed back in the 19th century when the maps were drawn. And uh, so between the two conf conflicting claims, there were a couple of uh, pieces, a couple of parcels of land that uh, were uh, in, in the no man's land. And Serbia was not claiming the land that was administered by Croatia. And Croatia was not, was, you know, said this is Serbia's land, but Serbia's not claiming it, okay? But Croatia's administering it because it happens to be on, their, on the Croatian side of the river. So that's, that's Lieberland. That's the piece of land. Croatia says it's not ours. Serbia says we don't want it. 
guy in, in uh, Czechoslovakia, I think, uh, the, the uh, Freedom uh, Libertarian uh, Style Party in Czechoslovakia or, or Czech Republic, said, ah, I will claim that under some uh, arcane international law uh, precedent, but not all that arcane because a couple of legal scholars at the, or legal students at the uh, uh, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago Law School said, you know, they did the research on it and, and came up with uh, an opinion saying that, you know, this, there, there's, there's a legal precedent for doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the seasteading ventures. There's been, you know, any number of uh, plans hatched for seasteading. None of I, I, I don't think any of them have come, have come to fruition yet, but there's certainly no reason why they couldn't. Right, uh, and you know there are six, I think six countries in Europe, six tiny countries like Liechtenstein and Monaco and such. Uh, they have no income tax. Well, they yeah, go entirely. Yeah. Their you, entire you, revenue is tourism. If you take a look at the most prosperous countries in the world, you have Liechtenstein, you have Monaco, you have Hong Kong, you have Singapore. All of them city states. Mm -hmm. Gibraltar, I, well that's a protectorate of England, but you have city-states where they do very well being essentially an entrepot uh, country, a trading country, uh, uh, you know, a transshipment country. So, you know, uh, where the heavy hand of government is uh, removed, economies flourish, even though there are no natural resources to speak of other than perhaps a harbor. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's no reason why uh, uh, a port built in Lieberland on the Danube, uh, which is a navigable river, a uh, navigable waterway. Except for when it freezes over like it did three years ago despite global warming. Oh, well. Yeah, no. imagine there, that. There, is, there are ice skates. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's, that's the, uh, oh, and then the, the reason this whole Lieberland thing came up is because the Libertarian National Committee last weekend uh, at its uh, quarterly meeting decided to pass a resolution supporting uh, recognition of labor land by the United States. So we're recommending to the President and to Congress that they uh, uh, issue a, a pro uh, that they you know vote to recognize labor land as an independent free country. So far Somaliland has done so. Of course Somaliland has its own issues about being recognized. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well that's fa fairly influential you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next topic, First and Fourth Amendment and Falcons. What the heck did Falcons have to do with, uh, with the Bill of Rights? Well, uh, imagine, if, imagine you're sitting in your home and, and it's in the middle of the night and, and armed agents in, in body armor carrying weapons knock on your door and demand entry. What was your crime, Richard? What was your crime? Uh, you tell me. This your, is your, your crime was uh, participating in the lawful sport of falconry. So there, there are a number of tiny populations of avid enthusiasts around this country who are, have basically been forced to give up their constitutional rights, sign them away. They didn't, they didn't really sign them away. They've been forced to give them away um, by these regulatory agencies. And, and both the, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife believe that. If you participate in the sport of falconry, they have the right to not only do a warrantless search of your home at any time to protect this poor, helpless falcon, but they also have the right to absolutely control your use of any imagery or the commercial use of your bird. You can't use it for anything other than promoting falconry. You can't sell pictures of it. You can't do anything else. Now, uh, this is strange in that if, if these departments of Fish and Wildlife were so concerned about the lives of these raptors, then they would close down the wind farm in Altamont Pass because in the last 30 years, one wind farm in Altamont Pass has been responsible for the death of 2,400 bald eagles. So apparently their, their real focus is not on um, the bird. What is their focus on? So. The, these small enthusiast groups, um, be, because they're so passionate about what they do, in this case falconry, which is, according to some people, the oldest sport in the world, um, I love the it so much. the oldest sport in the world had to take place in bedrooms, but. Well, that's, that's okay, that's a different show. Um, so what happens? They, 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 they're so passionate about what they love to do that, and so fearful that if they raise their hand and shout or protest, that they're, somebody's going to come in and just take these birds from them. So they, they basically Cried bow uncle. their heads. Cried uncle. They, they, but uh, Peter Stavriandakis and, and uh, et al. 
decided that uh, with Pacific Legal Foundation's help, because Pacific Legal Foundation bows its head to no one in the government, um, we're helping them. I work, I work for Pacific Legal Foundation raising money just to full this, disclosure. Yeah, yeah, full disclosure. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, why should you, and, and it's basically illegal. The Constitution says that you can't be forced to give up constitutional rights in order to perform a lawful activity. So we're, we're going to take them to court. There are wonderful uh, pit bull lawyers who are going to take these departments of fish and game, fish and wildlife to uh, court and, and straighten them out. Well, spe speaking of taking agencies to court, uh, you uh, went to work for uh, uh, Ed Point Event. Ed Point Event. Uh, Ed Point yeah. Event owned, uh, the, the case is called Warehouser, but that's because the Markle case, which Ed Point Event owns a significant chunk of a pine farm or a tree farm um, in Louisiana, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, the, um, the government, in its infinite wisdom, decided to um, call um, his area critical habitat for the dusky gopher frog, which until a few years ago was actually called a Mississippi frog because the only place it lived was in Mississippi over 50 miles away. Now, the problem with calling uh, this pine farm or tree farm critical habitat is that it's not even habitat. As it stands, the frog could not live there. Uh, the forest would have to be considerably thinned and changed um, to the tune of millions of dollars in order for the frog to even survive. So um, the Pacific Legal Foundation uh, and, and Weyerhaeuser Company combined cases. The Weyerhaeuser uh, attorney argued. And it was a wonderful eight to nothing decision in favor of uh, rational thinking and against the lun lunacy of calling habitat that can't be occupied by a critter as critical for the critter's survival. And uh, not only that, um, but they, they also decided in the same case that these critical habitat, habitat designations are judicially reviewable. The government said they were too expert and that nobody should be able to analyze what they do here because nobody could understand it. Tell us about the Chief Justice's uh, English lesson. Well, Chief Justice uh, uh, Roberts, uh, uh, with a, a Scalia-esque writing uh, turn, said that, uh, in his opinion, that an adjective modifies a noun. So in order for critical habitat, critical being the adjective, to be uh, critical habitat, that it actually had to be habitat. So rational thinking um, comes to the fore and wins, uh, uh, rarely in this country, but in that case it did, and it's, it's a tremendous win. Because you, know, you could say that you could raise uh, whales in Las Vegas if you built a big enough pool. Mr. Roberts, grammar teacher, thank you very much. This is the show for tonight. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, Channel 17, Sacramento. Uh, www.accesssacramento.org on the internet, Facebook, YouTube, you name it, we're, we're, we're there. See you again next week.